I was looking at my PhD yearbook, and then I noticed the motto I wrote there. It was very ordinary, it was very common, and I said to myself, why I did not even bother to look for something unusual or deeper because it says poverty is not a hindrance to success and that's very ordinary but a deeper realization made me more proud to say about that quote because I am a living example of that. So I was raised by my grandmother, and so my educational toil is basically hardship, struggles, and strenuous effort to finish it. I'd oftentimes go to school empty-handed, without a single centavo, and I used to sell that ice candy from my teacher in elementary. The food at the table is insufficient. My clothes, my shoes, my uniform, they're all pre-loved and giveaways. And this situation is even made more difficult and burdened by the perplexities of searching for my father. And he never recognized me until his death. What else could be more painful than to be rejected by your very own father? But then life goes on. You have to fight and battle because I believe that the only tool that I could use for this journey we call life is education. At first, I don't like to become an educator. I thought it's the most underrated profession. But eventually, you will learn that it's the most overwhelming at all times. So I finished my college, pursued my master's, finished and graduated my PhD. And just two months after my graduation, I was assigned as a school head. And so my 10 years of teaching experience and five years of school leadership enabled me to categorize the six diverse learners in the public school system and allow me to share my story in each of those learners. So the first one is the financially challenged learner. So my first assignment as a school head is basically a 30 kilometer away from our city and it's a small school and students are actually coming from nearby barangays where they have to uh, cross a river or walk a kilometer or two. And the students there, they're not well off, of course, and they have to come to school with no complete uniform, no complete school supplies, but really, I've seen my plight. I've seen my situation to those students. But really, they were very eager to pursue their studies. You would really love their persistence. And then, these students would probably finish an output coming from used materials. Some other students would even ask other students, I'll do your work, give me a penny. And talking of a school in which computers and the internet are hardly access accessible. And what is more intriguing 
the parents. They don't have that sufficient financial capacity, but they would always attend meetings. But of course, that's very touching because parental support is felt. Now, data would suggest that one in every 10 Filipinos aged 6 to 24 years is an out-of-school child or youth, and poverty incidence among Filipinos is registered at 26.3%. And so, when poverty would hit harder among our students, their tendency is to pull off from school. What then can we do to get hold of them? So for any students going through <laughs> same situation, maybe finding a relative or organization that can provide support. Projects and activities uh, need not to be expensive, so I think we have to strategize, apply for scholarships, summer job works, earn and save, and lastly, with your teachers. They will understand. For the teachers, now, they have to consider, of course, the financial capabilities of the students, of the learners. After all, in high school, it's not that as expensive compared to college. Uh, some of them, given the right information with their students, some teachers would shoulder the expenses of their students. And let us not demand for a computerized work at all times. Creativity applies, and for every parent out there, your support emotionally and physically is very, very appreciated. So, indeed, poverty will never be a hindrance in achieving your dreams. So we go to Diverse Learner 2. I say it's the problematic students. Now after two years and a half, I transferred post. I am now in the same school where I used to teach some 10 years ago. And so, in my first few months, security officer came to my office telling me that some of our students are actually did not enter the school premises. They were hanging around and oh God, they're smoking. And we're talking of some grade 7 and grade 8 students. So I talked to the security officer and said, we better capture them. And unfortunately, only about 5 of the 15 came to my office, ended in my office. They were expecting that I will have to scold them and send them to the blacklist. But it did not happen because it will never work for that, those kind of learners. I'd rather process them and allow that they will be able to realize what we are doing. In the turn of events, these students are now great senior high school students and to my surprise, they turned out to be honor students. So, what then? can we do with students who are considered as problematic students? We have behavioral problems in the school and oftentimes we would say these are the students at risk of dropping out. So these are the students who are always late and have tendencies to make trouble and bring chaos inside the classroom. So at the teacher or at the school level, um, first thing to do is to know the learner, okay? Talk to them and know the reason why they are doing so. Uh, for the parents and for the teachers, I think it's better if we will stop 
scolding and we, we will have to stop shouting at them. For the parents, your attention is very, very important. Know what the students are doing. Just imagine parents in Twitter, parents in Instagram, in, pa in Facebook, and of course, don't block them. So, parents should also go to school so that they can check on her or his progress, the learner. Now, for the learner, maybe the best solution is looking for the best support system. Find the right group, the right friends, and someone who can hone you to a better version of yourselves. So I'm coming to the fifth learner. I'm calling them the champions. So every year we have students winning in the different competitions, both academic and uh, co-curricular activities. We even heard students winning in international competitions. And I dream of that for our school. And we branded our school with Home of Champions. So it's like conditioning our students that in every competition, we really have to hit the highest position. Uh, it's basically, why would we earn, why would we aim for silver when there is gold? And I'm basically uh, referring to the students, not the geniuses one, not those students with having rocketing IQ, but students who happen to represent our school in different competitions. Because these students happen to suffer from setbacks. Because they have to go out from their classrooms, train, and when they get back, they have a lot of things to catch. Quizzes, performance tasks, project, and even lessons. So there's even the tendency that our students will have a lower grade than the previous quarter. So how do we make champions and not sacrificing their, their grades and the things that they could learn? So I say that when we will make champions, the first thing to do is, of course, to choose the right material, meaning the right student. And in as much as possible, no duplication of contests. Not a single student competing for different competitions. Focus is very important. And therefore, when we do that, uh, we really have to provide a competent coach. Someone who can provide technical assistance. Someone who can provide more inputs. Okay? So... When we do that, we would also need the support of the entire school and the entire community. Even by providing them with food or even cheers and applauses during the competition. It will definitely help. And never allow them to worry with their expenses. It should be the school leader taking charge of it. Uh, ensuring that nothing will be left. The contestants and their coaches will never worry about their expenses and they are left with no option but to win. So train up with that conditioning. We try to win in almost all competition at the division, in our division. And both in the academic and cultural competition. And when, we, when the students would bring home the bacon, let us try to reward them. Celebrate with them. Maybe we can provide plus points that are legal and necessary. And when they are coping with their grades and on their performance, they shall be given due considerations. And I go to the last learner. The average. <laughs> the average, yes. Because at the school level, we would always notice the extremes. 
super good, and the super bad. So the average in between is left and noticed. So Gatton said, is it a dirty word to be an average? Gatton said, yes, it is, because parents will not have favorable reaction. Then, let's try to do if you can move from an average to the next. So basically, uh, make sure that you will be noticed and introduce yourself to the teachers. Don't be afraid to be heard. Speak up and language your thoughts. Interact with your classmates and teachers. And for the teachers, um, said, get interactive, meaning not purely lecture discussion type. Shifting from one a pedagogy to the next. Test for individual skills. Think differentiated and help students show their mastery. However, despite a lot of efforts, seas of expectation will still surge. So have the motivation and the willingness to improve. After all, the label of an average is just a mindset of the parents and the teachers. But is it a bad thing to be an average? For me, it's not. At least you're not failing. But as Gasson put it, it is still essential for schools to foster classroom environment that draws the best performance out of the average learners. So, when you feel tired as a student, when you have no reason to get up in the morning, you don't have the motivation. When there is no sufficient money to spend for projects and tasks, when you are left with nothing but complaints, ask yourself, where in the spectrum of diversity are you? Are you? Because the only reason in passing the quarter or the semester probably will not lie in the life hacks you're watching, nor the professor or the school you're in, nor the book or the Wattpad you're reading because there is no common recipe to success and the answer always and will always lie in you. Once again, good morning.